Honorable James Edward Campus is an American businessman who currently serves as the director of the Office of Economy Impact and Diversity at the United States Department of Energy. This year at the World Green Growth Summit, he is a recipient of the award recognition most influential Hispanic leader in energy, economic impact, and sustainable energy development. Thank you for being here in this interview. Let me ask you some questions, Mr. James. How are you today? First, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate this opportunity. This is a great honor. It's a great honor to receive that award. I'm doing fantastic, and I hope everyone else is, including the audience. It's, uh, it's, it's a very uh, great treat to be here. Thank you. I'm very happy having you today. Uh, I have another question for you today. Equity in Energy is a visionary initiative to address the needs of the energy economy of the future. Could you elaborate on the impetus for equity in energy and its goals? Sure, sure, sure. And, and again, I'd just like to uh, uh, for, first thank you for the question. And before I fully respond, I'd like to thank you and, and your team for inviting me here today. It's an honor to talk about the important work we are doing in the Department of Energy's Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the office I serve. ED's mission is broad and diverse with a number of programs and initiatives that focus on meeting its statutory obligations on enhancing the value of the DOE's mission. ED's programs and initiatives that have focused on business education establish critical linkages among minority-serving institutions, minority businesses, minority-serving organizations, and federal agencies to address economic development in underserved communities and energy workforce development EDs in, uh, in, in the country. ED's programs and initiatives that have focused on civil rights, equity, and inclusion serve DOE's internal and external stakeholders. Now, I currently represent the DOE's enterprise on the following White House priorities. White House Council on Eliminating Regulatory Barriers to Affordable Housing, White House Opportunity and Realization Council, White House Hispanics and Excellent Education Initiative, White House Council on Asian American Pacific Islanders, and the White House Initiative to Promote Excellence and Innovation at Historically Black Colleges and Universities, which we call HBCUs. And we support the Federal Interagency Council on Crime Prevention and Improving Reentry and Hispanic Prosperity Initiative. So we do a, a vast amount of things at this office. Um, and I, I just wanted to go over a few of those points with you. Uh, mm -hmm. And then to go over what you asked originally was equity and energy um, and its importance. Um, it's a very important initiative for our country moving forward. Um, it's a program we are very, very proud of. We recently launched the Equity and Energy Initiative to support the nation's energy goals by fostering entrepreneurialism, innovation, and workforce partnerships. Now, Equity and Energy focuses on the importance of increasing interest and access to the energy economy for individuals in underserved communities. Interest and access is vital. We'll go over that a little bit more uh, following, but it's vital for Equity and Energy's uh, true uh, ability to effectuate change, needed change. Now, it expands the inclusion and participation of individuals in underserved communities in all the programs of the Department of Energy and in the private energy sector, from women and minorities to veterans and formerly incarcerated individuals. Equity in energy is working to secure America's national security and energy dominance through maximizing and engaging all human capital to ensure America's independence for generations to come. Now, the core pillars of equity in energy are one, workforce development, two, STEM enhancement, three, supplier diversity, four, technical assistance, and five, energy affordability. Additionally, technology, artificial intelligence, and biotechnology, entrepreneurship, workforce readiness, formerly incarcerated persons, and opportunity zones. That's amazing, very interesting. Um, I have another question for you, Mr. James. In your view, what are the most pressing needs in the energy industry right now and in the future? And how does equity in energy address those needs? And what is this important? That's great, great question. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, well, 
We all know that access to the right talent and human capital is, is key, fundamental to meeting the workforce challenge of the future. And increasingly, that workforce is diverse, which means our collective efforts must be inclusive and representative of this effort. And I know that you value inclusion and that you embrace differences in diversity. We all do. Nationally, according to the Census Bureau, this is important, in 2019 was the first year in which non-whites and Hispanics were a majority of the people under the age of 16. Furthermore, by 2045, the nation would become a minority white at 49.7% with Hispanics at 24.6%, African Americans at 13.1%, Asians at 7.9%, and 3.8% multiracial. These are, these are really important numbers moving forward. However, and this is a big however, women, African Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans are consistently underrepresented in both the STEM workforce and in STEM education. This is a national imperative that we fix. Mm -hmm. If we hope to remain strong, thriving, and vibrant nation, this trend has to change and change fast. It's an economic and national security imperative that we boost diverse representation in STEM and do so fast. And we can't just cruise in this direction and take it easy. We have to step on the gas. National security um, implications are large and looming. We need to do a better job in addressing these issues for our future sustainability and viability of our country's economic and energy economy. I see. Very interesting. Uh, what is the current administration focus in terms of energy policy? Uh, how does your work at the DOE support that? Another great question, Alejandro. The mission of the Energy Department is to ensure America's security and prosperity by addressing its energy, environmental, and nuclear challenges through transformative science and technology solutions. And this includes a surprisingly broad range of areas. For instance, from coal mines to pipelines, from wind turbines to warp drives, from the incredibly small and quantum science research to the infinitely large mysteries of the universe, including dark energy. Also, at the Department of Energy, we are tasked with maintaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent, reducing the threat of nuclear proliferation, and carrying out the environmental cleanup from the Cold or post-Cold War nuclear mission. As a science agency, the Energy Department plays an important role in the innovation economy. The department uses transformative growth and basic and applied scientific research the discovery and development of new clean energy technologies and prioritizes scientific innovation as a cornerstone of U.S. economic prosperity. Through initiatives like the Loan Guarantee Program and the Advanced Research Project Agency, Energy, the department funds cutting edge research and the deployment of innovative clean energy technologies. The, de the department now also encourages collaboration and cooperation between industry, academia, and government to create a vibrant scientific ecosystem. That's so crucial. Mm -hmm. Last week, for instance, President Trump released the National Strategy for Critical and Emerging Technologies, which outlines how the United States will promote and protect our competitive edge in wide-ranging technologies that are critical to U.S. national security and our economic advantage. This strategy lays the foundation for the United States to continue to turn ideas into innovations, transform discoveries into successful commercial products and companies, and protect and enhance the American way of life for many years to come for our children. As Energy Secretary Dan Boyette recently said, the intersection of science and security is one of the most important issues of our time, which is why the President Trump's national strategy for critical and emerging technologies is so vital to our long-term economic and national security interests. Now, the Trump administration is taking a whole-of-government approach to protect American technology and intellectual prop property as our industries of the future become more integrated into our daily lives. At the Department of Energy, we have taken actions to tighten compliance with respect to international science and technology cooperation across our phenomenal national laboratory research complex, which will continue to promote our national innovation base while protecting our technological advantage from adversaries, which is critical. 
Now, critical and emerging technologies include fields like artificial intelligence, energy, quantum information science, communications, and networking technologies, semiconductors, and space technologies. Under President Trump, the U.S. has made historic progress on strengthening our leadership and technologies of the future. The U.S. will promote this in, uh, innovative base, and American leadership in science, technology, research, and development, investment, workforce development, and public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships are so crucial. As our competitors and adversaries mobilize vast resources in these fields, American dominance in science technology is more important than ever. This administration continues to defend our industry and addresses unfair practices and creates a level playing field for the American worker. I'll give you an example. In July, the DOE released a report entitled The Appalachian Energy and Petrochemical Renaissance. The report key finding is the Appalachia's economic growth potential is extraordinarily high, even in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic economic setback, because of its abundant energy resources and talent. Appalachia is also critical to advancing America's future prosperity and energy security because it is now the nation's top producing region of natural gas and a major producer of coal and natural gas liquids. Even before COVID-19, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky were on track to enjoying a manufacturing revival. This is because of Appalachia's rich resources of low-cost natural gas, its strong, dedicated workforce, and the increased production of equipment directly related to energy production and leading research and development in automation and advanced manufacturing. Uh, are there any policy initiatives that you have worked on that and you are particularly passionate about, Mr. James? Uh, yes, Alejandra, I'm passionate about a lot. So uh, sure, <laughs> uh, great question. Um, okay, Opportunity Zones, for instance. The Opportunity Zones is an initiative created by the 2017 Tax, tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Well, now, this is designed to support economic development and job creation by encouraging long-term investments in low-income communities nationwide. Opportunity Zones are located in economically distressed communities designated by the chief executives of every U.S. state and territory. State and local officials continue to be actively engaged in the process as Opportunity Zones take place across our country, and may I say successfully. The incentive offers capital gains tax relief to investors for new investment in designated Opportunity Zones across the country. Now, 8,764 communities in all 50 states, D.C. and the five U.S. territories have been designated as Opportunity Zones. Now, Nearly 35 million Americans live in these communities designated as Opportunity Zones. That's a lot. We understand it takes a holistic approach to create meaningful economic realization. We need both private investment and a public sector commitment to Opportunity Zones to maximize this great, great initiative from the White House. Mm -hmm. It's why we are proud to represent the DOE on this interagency group dedicated to expanding our grant offerings and establishing program factors within Opportunity Zones to target these investments. CEA released their initial assessment of Opportunity Zones and the numbers are staggering and heartwarming. 75 billion invested, 500,000 new jobs, 11 billion in property value increase and on track to list one million people out of poverty. This is amazing. Plus, the President of the United States continued with the WHORC effort by signing an EO directing agencies to prioritize opportunity zones and distressed communities in new buildings and leasing. This is, again, a, a great, great thing going forward. Our office ourselves also recently issued 10 grants under the Minority Education and Workforce Training Program, totaling almost $4 million, which will serve over 60, uh, 60 Opportunity Zones, $2 million for the Workforce Division alone. Mm -hmm. There's so, many, so much information that not everybody knows. It's very interesting to have you today. I have another question, Mr. James. I understand your office has recently signed an MOU with the Department of Commerce and BDA. Could you elaborate on how that came about and what is the goals of the 
Banerjee are? Sure, sure, and, and, and that, that's an important thing our office uh, just engaged with not too long ago with uh, Director David Bird uh, of MBDA over in Commerce. Now, this MOU is crucial. It will improve access and resources for industries within the energy sector, as well as build awareness, capacity, and create pathways to opportunities for our energy supply stakeholders to include many of you who work time out from your business schedules to participate in the summit. Now, my office and MBDA will work collaboratively to open doors for minority business enterprises. Together, we will leverage our agency resources and identify key strategic stakeholders that can assist with overcoming challenges that often hinder the success of such uh, endeavors. MBDA and ED, my office, will also work together to improve access to training workshops, workforce opportunities, nationwide business centers, and other business-related opportunities that would benefit minority businesses and minority-serving institutions. It is a phenomenal uh, coming together, an example of how different departments and agencies across the government can come together, work together for the betterment of us all. I'm very happy with your uh, participation today. I again congratulations for your, our recognition for the most influential Hispanic leader in energy, economy impact, and sustainable energy development. Uh, we would love to have your next year again in our summit. Uh, also, we would like you keep serving for our government. Uh, it's very, I'm very happy having in this in this summit so many governments talking about their programs, their goals, what is their projects, and I'm very happy having you here today. It was an honor having you, Mr. Campos, and thank you to everyone who watches. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you.